Yes, hello. Um, I'm pleased to be here. My name is Antje, as I was just introduced. Um, I'm a designer and not an innovation manager, which makes me different. But you, you will learn in this next minutes that the design department or the, the, the group of designers within IBM has a, an essential role in the innovation of our products. I tell you the IBM design transformation story, which is already 10 years old. I just realized that we started in 2012, and well, we actually we started in 2013, which is 10 years ago. And uh, this is why I added also some thoughts about how it is now, and you know, if we all live happily ever after, or what uh, what happens to a transformation if it gets old <laughs> or stagnant or living. Oh, wait, let me just take. Well, um, I didn't set up a poll, but maybe you can just shout out to me. What do you think when you hear IBM? Watson? Software? Design thinking? <laughs> PCs, yeah. We, I just had a talk over lunch that IBM actually had the first personal computer until we sold it, and hardware is also very important to IBM. Yeah, everything correct? Um, IBM and design, just uh, going a bit further back into history, uh, what you see here is uh, Mr. Thomas Watson Jr. And actually, that's the reason why the product is called Watson. It's had no nothing to do with Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the founder of IBM was uh, Thomas Watson, and this is his son. And he actually got interested in design. It's said that uh, he was walking around in uh, Manhattan and saw a store by Olivetti, uh, uh, an Italian typewriter company with really cool design, and he was thinking, "Ah, oh, this is really cool, and why are our products so you know so boring and our not, uh, design wise and uh, how why are our sales rooms uh, they look like a first class dining room and a on a cruise ship? I want to be a bit more like Olivetti and what he did he started the first design program ever at that part that was in the 50s, uh, more uh, around branding and, um, you know, overall branding, but it was the first design program. And what he did, he hired a lot of really famous designers. So if you know our logo or the Rebus, that was done by Paul Rand, uh, a very famous graphic designer from America. This couple that you see here is Charles and Ray Eames, uh, also you might know the Eames chair. I know I'm not talking to designers, but all these products are really icons in the, uh, in the product world. And uh, you see Elliot Noyes, who led the design program during that time. And you see products that IBM was producing at that time, which are mainframes, type, you know, say, um, storage, and the famous uh, typewriter with his... Uh, ball head that went really, really fast. That was also an innovation at the time. But okay, stopping talking about the past, what happened to IBM after being really, really design-minded was that they lost their focus. They also they lost their, design-wise, they lost their focus. Um, they went from a hardware company, which was very design-oriented, to a software and services company. And at that time, Nobody was really interested in human-centered design, design as such. It was an engineering company working for engineers. So our clients were IT nerds, and the IBMers were IT nerds, and they got along really, really well. <laughs> Until the time that uh, also, you know, the transition in the, in the 2000s, where the business departments took over the budgets from the IT departments. Um, during the 80s, 90s, the IT departments really ruled the world. They could decide, they had the, the large money to invest, and this money shifted because uh, during that time, um, IT was outsourced a lot, and the business stayed within the companies, and, uh, and suddenly the business people made the decisions also about what software to buy, what, uh, what, what IT solutions to buy, and they had that they thought differently, and the software wasn't designed for them anymore because it was designed for the engineers. So IBM was in sort of deep shit selling their really, really good software, which wasn't usable. 
oh, I talked a lot. <laughs> uh, that was the time where we had um, as um, Ginny Rometty as a president, and she said, well, what I want to do differently now is I want to focus on client experience, uh, and I want our products to become client-focused and user-focused again. And the guy she hired for, for that, he was already in the company because we bought his company, uh, <laughs> was Phil Gilbert. Uh, Phil Gilbert was the head of Lombardi at that time. That was a business process management software um, that had less functionality than the equivalent from IBM, but was you know, bought by much more companies because it was extremely usable. Um, first reaction from IBM, okay, we buy them. <laughs> Second reaction, um, okay, what, what do they do differently and can we install that with an IBM? And that is the reason why Ginny asked Phil to set up a design program across IBM. And that was a real game, ch game changer because uh, we used to change what we worked on, but now we were changing how we work. And it was a recommitment to designing for people and not for technology. So when we started that program in 2012, and let me tell you, I'm a, an old-time IBMer. I've, I've experienced most of, the, not the old mainframes, but <laughs> I'm there for a very long time. So, so it's a bit of my story because I've I know all these people and I've been experienced, experiencing, experiencing this personally. <clears throat> So we had a talent gap. There weren't any designers that did human-centric work with an IBM, hardly any except for me no, and some others. Um, we had unsuitable places. So, so this is a picture of an IBM office during that time. Um, and we had no common way of working or thinking, so missing practices. And if you were looking into the product development teams that were developing the IBM products, there was a ratio, a ratio of one designer to 70 devel developers, which could not work. <laughs> um, so the target was to get up to 1 to 16, a uh, really huge target. So we, induct, uh, we embarked on that journey <clears throat> to create a sustainable culture of design and design thinking. That was our mission that uh, Gini Rometty gave us at that time. And, of course, at global scale, um, we were 350,000 around the world, so that's a big company. And the formula we were using was people, places, and practices um, equals outcomes. So what, what did we do with the people? We had to acquire missing skills. So the first thing that we did was uh, we hired people from the market, also senior design leaders that were able to set up an organization together with the, those designers that were already there. And, uh, and we started to do design programs, went to the universities, hired people, so that within a year or within three years, we had a thousand designers with an IBM. We could only do that um, by setting up the foundations for that, and we had that in the uh, Porsche part as well. So design was not a profession at that time. When I started uh, to work at IBM, I was made an IT specialist because uh, design didn't exist. So uh, <clears throat> the, only starting in 2012, 13, we were talking with HR to make design an own profession. It's still a so-called so technical profession in contrary to sales or management, but it is a profession uh, where you can have a career. So if we want to have thousands of designers, we have to give them a perspective on, in order to, to grow within a company. Um, then places. So what did we do with all these places? How could designers work in these distributed open offices that had no spirit at all? So we started to started we started an initiative to to build studios, um, and it was actually there was budget in this initiative because it was CEO um, injected. But still, the first prototypes we had was really. You know, they just teared off the walls in Austin. Austin was our design headquarters at that time because Phil Gilbert came from Austin, so they moved everything to Austin, Texas. Um, and he actually also ran, ran around in cowboy boots all the time. <laughs> um, so so they, they, they explicitly decided to not go into a cool building in the inner city like, you know, German companies 
try to build their innovation hub in Berlin, whereas they sit in the middle of nowhere. They, they installed the studio within the old IBM offices and they just tear down walls and, and put in IKEA furniture. <laughs> um, which is uh, and you know and 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 tried things move things around until they had an idea how to how they wanted it and and then they started to do uh, to build things properly but still with the idea to have things movable move walls around move tables around every everything should have been movable at that time um, in order to roll that out worldwide there was a studio program set up uh, which helped you know, which gave us empowerment and activated and engaged the community worldwide to set up studios themselves. Um, they helped with governance. Um, they made some measure measurements on what, what should a studio have, how many uh, designers should work in a studio. Uh, this is what we give you um, in order to work well. And also, they also provided a platform um, infrastructure. They had the, uh, all this design software and programs were, were managed centrally uh, in the US so that all these smaller studios worldwide didn't have the struggle to go through these processes themselves. So at that time, in 2015, I also opened a studio here in Germany. <clears throat> and then the biggest part, and also the most important part today, practices. So um, the shift from engineering-centric to user-centric, okay, one of the practices is we also needed a, a design language. I'm not going to talk about that much uh, today. Uh, we, can, we, we had a clear branding then and also an overall design system we used. Uh, we set experience standards for our products. And what I love most is even at that time, we also already put in end use um, in order for a sustainable circle uh, thing that if, you, if we think about a, use, a product usage or a product journey, uh, you always have to think about what to do with a product if you don't use it anymore. But what I want to talk about today not in detail because you probably all know design thinking, but the most important practice in the ways of working is uh, the enterprise design thinking practice that IBM set up. So, okay, another story. <laughs> Phil Gilbert went to, uh, went to Stanford where the IDEO people sat and he was talking to... Um, I forgot his name, the, the guy that, you know, thought, thought this all out and said, you know, I want to do this and I want to do this for, for, for the whole company and I want to, do, want to have this for product teams that are distributed and about 3,000 people large. And that guy said, you will never make it. <laughs> and so they set up a team to, to make a, I, I call it a dialect of design thinking, to do that at scale. So you know the general principles of design thinking. And we also first had um, the hexagons, um, which we eliminated because we found out that uh, people were thinking about the hexagons in a way that they thought, okay, we're going through all these steps and then we're done. <laughs> so... So uh, the, um, the distinguished designer that was working on the, uh, on the methods was radically just pushing it away and said, no, our new symbol for design thinking is the loop. So if we see the, this uh, infinity sign, that's the IBM sign for enterprise design thinking, saying observe, reflect, make. And of course, then you go back through the loop and observe again after you made and you... Uh, reflect and observe, and it never ends. So this is really important. What is also important about um, enterprise design thinking are the three uh, objects you have on the right uh, column. Uh, hills is something that we uh, we introduced to design thinking that helps help with alignment because one of the hardest things you probably also experience if you're in the innovation business is that aligning people from different functions and different business units is the hardest thing. So working on hills, um, maybe it's a bit like OKRs, but it's not OKRs. Uh, they have a special syntax that is user-centric and describe the experience the user will have when the product is finished. So these are hills. Usually you have th three hills per product or per, per uh, increment. Um, then playbacks. Of course, everybody knows playbacks. Uh, if you have something finished, uh, you, you show it back. But there was a certain 
structure to these playbacks, also to align the team, also the wider teams of stakeholders that were um, not always part of the core product team. And th these playbacks were also always meant to be, to, to be told uh, story-driven and person-driven, user-driven. And sponsor users, um, IBM worked a lot with users from companies they worked for and integrated them in the team. So it was not like user research where you go for focus groups, but more people that, that you come back to and uh, you show your increments and the, that you actually not, not really integrate, but you constantly ask back if what you just developed or thought of would be something that would help them, uh, especially then users from our main clients of, you know, in the B2B business, it's, it's, uh, there, there's another, there's a different relationship. But for these sponsor users, we usually made NDAs and then we worked with these sponsor users. So outcomes, um, we heard so much about business KPIs and how important that is, also in innovation. Also in this part, uh, we asked Forrester to make a study, and they have a spe specific um, they have a specific method of um, measuring the ROI. They call it the uh, total economic impact. And they were talking to six different projects from IBM, and also projects that we did as IBM with clients and came back with the results that, of course, if you work in that way, you are much faster. So a lot of ve velocity. Um, you have more alignment. Um, so in this case, you also have reduced development time. And in, um, you know, as a total result, you have a much higher uh, return on investment if you work with this method. So this is until 2018. So then about scaling. So we had 3,000 designers at IBM and 300,000 IBMers. That's a very small amount of people. So how, how do you get this through the company? Um, and we did this with uh, enablement and activation and training of most IBMers uh, to learn about design thinking and to integrate them into our products, uh, projects. Um, we had a lot of boot camps. Uh, where we also had projects and products teams visiting and working with them. We had boot camps where we taught design thinking. We did a lot of advocate courses because we found out that if you don't uh, take the executives with you, it doesn't work. So we had special executive trainings, which were a bit shorter because they don't have any, that much time, but they, they get the idea and that then support uh, the, the way of working. So that, that's what we called advocate courses. We established a digital learning platform, which helped us a lot, especially during COVID. And we, during COVID, we also opened that platform. So if you want to have a certification in IBM design thinking or enterprise design thinking, you can go on ibm.com slash design and take the course and get a certificate. And uh, we uh, introduce with that also a badging system that people can take with them also when they leave the company. Um, it's, being, um, it, it's being put on Cradly and you can, can you move them with, uh, Cradly with them. So we had practitioners, co-creators, then coaches that are able to coach teams. We have the advocate badge and we have the leader badge for people who drive this within the company and uh, have a deeper knowledge of design thinking. We helped um, um, establishing that uh, with chapters that were built all over, uh, all over the locations worldwide where people who were interested in design thinking got together and talked about problems and, uh, and uh, had an exchange no matter what business unit they were in. Um, yeah, that's the design thinking part. What did we do with the design unit? So Phil Gilbert was VP of design. The whole initiative came out of product. But um, the IBM design program and IBM design was meant to be a matrix organization that was across business units. And you can see here, by now, we have a lot of designers, most of them in consulting. That's where I come from. Uh, we have... Uh, designers in software, but we also have designers in infrastructure, we have designers in corporate, and we have a design program office where everything um, functional about design, about design careers, about design infrastructure is being decided. And I brought you one example how design 
evolved in one of the more corporate functions. And as we're talking about HR, I took that one. <laughs> uh, since 2018, we focused a lot on employee experience as well, also with the people that were coming out of the design organization. And their main focus was simplification. So simplify work for our employees, where we had a lot of different systems. These are HR examples. We tried to simplify them, get them back into one platform, have a, a personal better experience. We have a platform with a typical IBM personas, employee personas, where everything is checked against. And we also try to um, simplify our infrastructure. So our It's called CIO Office within IBM. That's the organization that, is, that cares for the software and tools that every IBMer has for his or her work. And as, uh, Fletcher Plevin was somebody who was really, he was actually a designer in that position. He said, every minute spent struggling with an IT system is a minute not spent on delivering value for IBM and our clients, and we should invest in that. So... Um, There is a team of designers also in this organization. They have large challenges, you see, even in this organization. They have 12,000 employees and 3,000 applications they are supporting. Um, but they, they started to inject designers in uh, initiatives that they thought were really worth it. And they also came up with factors for prioritization. So which... which, um, which Internal IBM applications do we want to simplify for our users and help them to have a higher impact? I need to speed up. Where are we now? <laughs> so, uh, 10 years from now, uh, practices. I think we're good with practices in a way that we adopted to a lot of things that came up in the business. So it's not only the design language and the enterprise design thinking. We now have uh, design thinking for AI. Uh, we have design thinking for thinking ethical for AI. We have design for accessibility. We have uh, a large uh, research um, practice and we also have design for sustainability, all sorts of different practices around design and design thinking frameworks that we use. Um, we have a high expertise in working in distributed teams uh, because people sit everywhere. A good proficiency in digital whiteboard work as well, which helped us a lot during COVID and the lockdown. Um, but on the other hand, Oh, okay, uh, just uh, inject this. And of course, the IBM design thinking went into the larger innovation frameworks that we have. So you might have heard about IBM Garage. This is our way to scale um, ideas into MVPs, into uh, the large enterprise. I'm not talking about this. I just wanted to mention it. Um, but the whiteboard and distributed part, um, we have now... A lot of cool spaces, which were, some of them have been renovated during COVID, but um, most of them are empty <laughs> because people love it at home. <laughs> And uh, we are still working on how to get people back together. So that, that is a large challenge. And uh, we're trying to initiate working weeks where people from a one project travel to one one location and work there for a whole week for my, for within a month so that, that we get this working spirit back into the team. We have a lot of people hired during COVID or just before COVID who just didn't, have never experienced how it is to work in a physical team. Um, the teams change, the management changes, also people we hired into the team during the last years. We always thought, okay, they know what agile is and they learned design thinking in university. And then I suddenly realized Oh, no, though there isn't much, there, there isn't much that they bring in. We have to continue our education. So this is something we have to keep up again, uh, because we are, we are getting into a, a bit of low of um, knowledge and experience that our practitioners have. So we have pockets of excellence, but we need pervasive excellence. And uh, how are we planning to do that? Um, Improve our insights team, so even build more on user research and how do we bring that back into our products. Uh, still empower our teams um, and give our, our designers more opportunities to learn and grow. Um, um, train our new talent, um, 
get back to the training programs we had before COVID and even build on them and get new training programs. Okay, takeaways. I do that fast. <laughs> Uh, reinventing the status quo doesn't happen overnight. So if you want to scale a large organization with design thinking and design uh, methodologies, stage one is experimenting with human-centered ways of working, maybe just with one team and take others along. Stage two would be scaling best practices, establishing human-centered infrastructure, so scale that what you just did. And in stage three, I wish we would be there. <laughs> Human-centered design is business as usual. Sometimes maybe you are there and then you fall back again. There are also misconceptions. Uh, you just have to hire designers and everything will be okay. Forget about it. And I have also seen large companies that hire designer, like junior or mid-weight designers, into production teams and say designers and delivery. Uh, if I just spread some designers in these teams, uh, it'll work. It doesn't. It doesn't because you don't have the, you know, the leadership that that you need to get this across the company and also to be stakeholder for your subject. Uh, just MVPs quickly doesn't help as well. Only workshops with sticky notes that doesn't help either. Cool workspaces doesn't don't help. Uh, we know that now. We have cool workspaces. Nobody's there. Uh, you need to quantify everything immediately. No, it helps to have give some time, but in the end, of course, you have to show the results. And uh, if you think you're always already doing all this and just need to scale, also that can be a challenge. So adoption is linear, simple, and won't take too long. No way. <laughs> um, so if you start, or if, if you start in some way, uh, especially with integrating design and becoming more design and user-centered, don't be afraid to use a user-centered approach also for this uh, endeavor. Take your employees with you on the journey right from the start. Ensure prominent support of top management and install a strong design leader. This all hadn't worked if Ginny Rometty wasn't there and decided that she wanted it with a, through the whole com company. And if a person like Phil Gilbert hadn't been there to push it in the right way. <clears throat> Be coached by proven experts, so if you don't have any designers in your company, well, get some help. And experiment and correct the course if necessary. So observe, reflect and make. You can also apply that to change, to transformation, to everything you do. And uh, I, I just love to this quotation from McKinsey. <laughs> um, for the design profession, designers might add as much value redesigning your company as redesigning your product. So don't under, underestimate designers. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Oh, one, one more quote and I'll put it away again. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you for this really nice uh, um, presentation. Um, so from SAP, and we did a similar journey, by the way. But um, I, uh, some slides back, I saw something like um, you have uh, designed for sustainability, mm -hmm. designed for this and that. Can you explore this a bit further? What do you mean with you have designed for sustainability? Yeah, we, th these are, um, these are um, variants of the design thinking framework. So we have some, if you go through the, uh, the, the process of uh, uh, building a product, we have some specific templates where you think about uh, the impact on uh, CO CO2 emission or you know, all these parts that belong to sustainability, we cover them. Or within the Design for AI Essentials uh, uh, has, in addition to the, the, the still important user-centered way of design thinking, has some exercises where we identify the intents for the AI which would meet the user's problem. Um, where we see which data we have and also which impact uh, the, the solution would have uh, 
to empower the user, to have power over the user, to, you know, it's also to do evil, all these levels of impact in order to, to think ethically and make sure that you don't have a bias or evil solution um, from the start, even before you started programming it, to, to consider all these things that could happen. Okay, so... Um Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's, uh, okay. that's it for now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh.